Good morning to you all. I'm sure we've greatly enjoyed and be challenged by our time of worship together. And we come now to listen to what the Lord has to say to us from his word, from this very important part of his word, Romans chapter 11. Uh, and as we begin this morning, I want to revisit the question of why we have these chapters, chapters 9 to 11, in the epistle to the Romans at all. We've all been greatly enjoying, I think, the truths of the epistle as Paul has opened up to them in the first eight chapters of how he has brought to us the wonderful truth of justification by faith in chapter 4 of the epistle. And then he goes on in the next few chapters, 5 to 8, to talk about what I might call the great freedoms that we have in Christ. The freedom from the wrath of God in chapter 5, freedom from sin in chapter 6, freedom from bondage to the law in chapter 7, and life in the spirit in uh, chapter 8. And then suddenly we come to these chapters in which he wrestles with the problem of Jewish unbelief and why his own people have not responded to this wonderful gospel that he's been expounding. Why, is it, why does he take these three chapters to do that? Why doesn't he go straight on to chapter 12 and begin to talk about the, where he begins to talk about the practical issues of Christian living for the rest of the epistle? Why does he spend so much time on these lengthy chapters about the problem of Israel's unbelief? Why is Paul so concerned about the problem of Israel's unbelief? Well, I think, uh, isn't he, after all, the apostle to the Gentiles? Isn't that meant to be his concern? Well, I think the answer is precisely this, that he is concerned about the issue of um, Jewish unbelief precisely because he is the apostle to the Gentiles. And that's why he's writing these chapters. It is true that one reason for his writing is his great burden for his fellow Israelites, but there's another reason that he makes clear in verse 13 when he says, Now I am writing to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. In other words, what he is saying is that the truths that he is outlining here in chapters 9 to 11 are intended for Gentile believers. It is for them to understand and for them to digest. He's very clear about that. Now, why is Paul insisting that his teaching is so important for Gentile believers? Well, one reason is that Paul wants these Gentile believers to have a, a deep and certain understanding of their spiritual identity in Jesus Christ. He wants them to have a clear understanding of their place uh, in God's purposes and in the salvation history that began back with Abraham. You see, the spread of the gospel, the salvation of the Gentiles, was not some afterthought for God. It was not as though God was saying, oh, well, um, my people that I had chosen, they've rejected the gospel, so I'll turn my attention to something else and uh, we'll now send the, the gospel to the Gentiles. That's not what it is at all. God was always intending that his gospel would have universal appeal. God was always intending that the gospel would be carried to the utmost ends of the earth. He was always intending this from the time of Abraham when he spoke to Abraham and said to him in chapter 22 
He said to Abraham, in you and in your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And it was always God's intention then that the gospel would go out to the Gentiles. And the New Testament expresses this in various ways. And not only that, that the, but that the Gentiles would be brought into and included within the people of God which would include Jews and Gentiles. And the New Testament is very, very clear on this. Paul's writings in particular are very clear on this. For example, in Galatians chapter 3, he tells us that Gentile believers are all children of Abraham by faith. And as I reminded you previously in Ephesians chapter 2, he uses another illustration where he says that Gentiles who were once strangers to the covenants of God, once far off from Israel, have now been brought near, and they've been included in the covenants of God. And the, both Jew and Gentile believers are incorporated into what Paul calls one new man, or one new humanity, or to use the illustration that Paul gives us here in Romans chapter 11, that Israel is like the olive tree. The branches have become dead, but new shoots, wild shoots, Gentile shoots have been grafted in to this olive tree, grafted into Israel. And through their life, new life is granted to the tree as a whole. And so Paul wants us as Gentile believers to truly understand our identity as the people of God. This is our spiritual genealogy, if you like, that we are all the children of Abraham by faith. And so these chapters are not just some sideshow. They are very central and important in giving us the uh, sense of who we are. And now as we come to verse 25, he wants to apply the lessons that Gentile believers should be learning from what he has had to say even more closely. He says this, lest you be wise in your own sight, I want to explain this mystery to you in verse 25. And I think that at this point, Paul is not just addressing the Gentiles, he's addressing them all because he uses that word brothers, Jews and Gentiles. He, he wants them all to understand uh, this mystery. And uh, it's as though Paul has been saying, up until now you've been looking at this mystery, that I've been unfolding it to you, how God is working and how God has been work, working, and I want to disclose the meaning of this mystery to you. What's its meaning? Well, actually, we might ask, and I'm sure some of you are asking, what exactly is the mystery? We need to know what the mystery is before we understand the meaning of the mystery. And Paul uses this word mystery several times in his writings in the New Testament. In fact, the word mystery itself comes from the Greek word that Paul uses. It is the word mysterion in Greek. So that's where our English word mystery comes from. And the mystery, when Paul speaks about a mystery, he's not talking about some insoluble uh, kind of mystery that we can't put our finger on, that we can't possibly solve for ourselves. When he uses the word mystery, he's talking about something that is hidden and mysterious to us until God discloses its meaning to us. Uh, and usually these mysteries are unfolded to us and become clear through Jesus Christ. If you look back into the Old Testament, you will find that it is full of mysteries. You have a mysterious figure like King Melchizedek in the Old Testament. You have uh, the, the mysteries of, of the sacrificial system. Uh, you have uh, the, the mysteries concerning figures like the suffering servant of Isaiah. Uh, 
or mysteries concerning a future king who was promised, who is called the Anointed One or the Messiah. And all of these remain mysteries in the Old Testament. But they all find their solution in Jesus Christ, as we find when we come to the New Testament. And now Paul is saying, in connection with this movement of God among the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, he wants us to understand that God wants us to understand this mystery. He does not want us to be ignorant of it. And so this morning, we're going to look at this mystery. And first of all, let us look at the nature of the mystery in verses 25 and 26. Now, it's clear, as I've said, that Paul wants us to understand the mystery. In verses 25 and 26, he says, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. And among the questions that have been raised are these ones. What does it Paul mean when he says that all Israel will be saved? What does he mean by the expression, the fullness of the Gentiles? What does he mean when he says, in this way, all Israel will be saved? Now, over the years, I've read numerous commentaries on this section of Romans and numerous articles as well and have found a bewildering number of interpretations. Uh, but let me say two things. First of all, if they don't agree with me, they're wrong. <laughs> and second one that's more serious, that whatever our interpretation of this passage, if we do not see Paul's heart afire with love for the gospel and afire with love for evangelism, then we've missed the whole point of the passage, friends. The main point of prophetic passages in Scripture is not to make you and me armchair experts in the details of God's prophetic plan or program. But people who don't care anything about for the salvation of other people. Uh, I pray that as we read this passage together and think about it, that God will give us all, whether we're in total agreement on all its details, may God give us all something of the burning passion which the Apostle Paul has for evangelism. That's the key element that shines through this whole chapter, this anguish that he has this anguish that he has for people who are lost, whether they're Jew or Gentile, but particularly his own fellow Jews who were not responding to the gospel. Let us be a, ask God that we might be afire with something of Paul's passion as we study this passage. Now, keeping in mind the differing, some of the differing views on this passage, let me present what I think is an account that is consistent with what Paul is expressing here. And I'm going to ignore all, as many as possible, of the controversial things which are not profitable for a Sunday morning. But before we press on, let me just make one observation. Most of the disagreement about passages and aspects of this uh, passage ar don't arise from the passage itself. They arise out of the effort that people make to see where this passage fits in with other passages. And trying to put all the different passages from different parts of the New Testament together to try and fit this in at some stage of some future prophetic development. It's like doing a kind of a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, I'm not altogether sure that that's a profitable thing because one thing I really do think is that we shall never be actually certain of how a prophecy is going to be fulfilled until we see it being fulfilled. 
I could speak for quite a bit of time on that this morning, but I won't. But let's turn our attention back to this passage itself. First of all, Paul says, a partial hardening has come upon Israel in verse 25. Now, he's been teaching that, of course, all the way through, hasn't he? Back in chapter 9, he was talking about that when he said that uh, uh, um, uh, it, it was only a partial hardening of his heart because, first of all, he himself was a Jew, that he himself had come to put his faith in Jesus Christ. And then he quotes the Old Testament and speaks about um, Elijah and of how in the time of King Ahab, when the whole nation seemed to have turned for, for away from God, that uh, Elijah said, oh God, I'm the only one who's left. And God said, don't be foolish, Elijah. There are 7,000 others in Israel who have not bowed their knees to foreign gods. And then in the time, uh, in the New Testament itself, on the day of Pentecost, in the earliest chapters of the book of the Acts, the, the, the church was uh, comprised entirely of Jewish people, 3,000 of them on the day of Pentecost and thousands subsequently. So that by the time Paul visited Jerusalem and spoke to James, the leader of the church, later in the book of the Acts, James was able to say to him, see, Paul, now how many thousands of Jews there are who are believing in Christ. And so it is a partial hardening of the heart. And throughout the world today and in the days since, there have been Jews who have been coming to Christ. And there is work that is going among Jewish people uh, in the present day. And some of you know about that, and some of you pray about that, and you know about movements such as Messianic Judaism and so on. So it is a partial hardening of the heart that has come upon Israel, only partial. And then he goes on to say, this partial hardening of hearts is only until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. That's what he says in verse 25. Now, what does Paul mean when he uses this phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles? Well, Paul is anticipating a day when the gospel will have spread to all nations when multitudes of Gentiles would have been brought to faith in Christ. And God in his amazing wisdom will have done something that is truly remarkable with a, this great influx of Gentile believers coming to him. And we see that, the progress of the gospel today going out into all the world. And when that process is complete in God's eyes, that will be the time of the fullness of of the Gentiles, and uh, and the word uh, until until the, the fullness of the Gentiles comes means that that time is not going to go on forever. That time will draw to a close, and when that time draws to a close, then in this way Paul goes on to say, by this process. Israel will be saved. Now let's be clear on one point. When Paul says all Israel, he does not mean every individual Israelite who has ever lived, past, present, and future, or has actually every Israelite who is on the earth when this fullness of the Gentiles come. The expression all Israel is frequently used in Scripture and is used to imply a sort of a general totality of people, a large number of people. And I think that what Paul is saying is this, that when the gospel has penetrated to the ends of the earth, to the entire Gentile world, and when the fullness of the Gentiles thereby has come in, then there will be a wonderful, mysterious, miraculous, working of the saving grace of God. And God is going to lift the veil from the eyes of his ancient people and multitudes of them will seek Jesus Christ as their savior. How wonderful and how marvelous this is when the gospel 
came to Israel, they rejected their Messiah and they rejected the gospel of his grace. But when that gospel message has reached to the boundaries of the world, God will lift the veil from their eyes and multitudes of Jewish people will come to accept Jesus Christ as Messiah and Lord. This is why Paul says, if their rejection of Christ has meant salvation for the world and their ongoing rejection has brought salvation to the Gentiles, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Or to use another illustration that is already used in this passage, that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, that olive tree of Israel will spring to new life again. Now, that seems to me to be a view that is entirely consistent with what Paul is saying. This, he's saying this is a mystery. Gentile believers would never have worked this out, would they, for themselves? We need the revelation of God in Scripture to uh, understand this. And here is Paul, a converted Jew, called to be the apostle to the Gentiles, yet agonizing over the spiritual condition of his own people. And it's a mystery. It's, a, it's been a mystery to him. Why? Why has this been happening? And God has unfolded it to him, that he is an apostle to the Gentiles precisely towards the end of bringing salvation back to his own people again in order that when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, there might be this great returning of his own people to the Lord. And so Paul is seeing a day coming when the gospel harvest will be reaped among, uh, when the gospel harvest has been reaped among the Gentiles, when the fullness of the Gentiles will come in and he will lift the veil and remove the hardness from the hearts of the Jewish people. And that, incidentally, is a tremendous motivation for evangelism. God has placed most, if not all of us, in a context of witness to Gentiles, hasn't he? Have any of you got Jewish friends? Perhaps you have, but very few of us, I think, because there aren't all that many Jews to befriend in New Zealand. In the 2016 census, there were 5,274 people throughout the length and breadth of this country who professed the Jewish religion. So you may not have had opportunities to witness to them. I've had opportunities to witness to Jews, but not here. Surprisingly, in India. When I visited the Cochin back in the 1960s, you'll remember the 1960s, most of you. <laughs> I visited an ancient synagogue there in Cochin. Jewish community there. Most of them had gone back to Israel after the state of Israel was founded. But there were still Jews there. And they had come there after the fall of the first temple during the time of the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And they'd been there ever since. And I had the opportunity to visit the synagogue and have a chat and talk about the Messiah to the guardian of the synagogue. But most of us don't have that chance. But you know, evangelism of Gentiles, and this is the whole point of this passage, one of the points of this passage, in evangelizing Gentiles and witnessing to them, we're hastening the day when this is going to happen, aren't we? We're contributing to the fullness of the Gentiles when God is going to lift the veil from the eyes of Jewish unbelievers, and there are going to be masses of them turn to Christ. So it is an impetus to evangelism of all kinds. Now Paul goes on and he slips in like he so often does, as we've seen it in Romans, he slips in an Old Testament verse. And this brings us to our third point, the Old Testament witness of 
to the mystery, verses 26 and 27. And uh, he says that this mystery that is now being revealed has actually been promised in the Old Testament. And he quotes from Isaiah chapter 59. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. But it's very interesting to notice the wording. And Paul changes it, changes one word, which is very significant when he quotes this. And he does this because he wants to bring out the application of the scripture to his own time. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 20 speaks about the deliverer coming to Zion. Paul quotes it as the deliverer coming from Zion. Now, of course, Zion is the Old Test an Old Testament way of uh, describing Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem is often called Zion in the Old Testament. And uh, why does Paul change it? He changes it because the Redeemer, the Deliverer, has already come to Zion. He's come to them. Jesus came to Zion. He died on the cross in Zion. He was buried in Zion. He rose from the dead in Zion. He ascended to heaven in Zion. But now in the gospel, he's coming from Zion. The Holy Spirit came out on the day of Pentecost, filled the disciples, and the spread of the gospel began. And Jesus Christ comes in the gospel. He's coming from Zion everywhere the gospel is preached. It's marvelous, isn't it? The, uh, this fulfillment is taking place, that the deliverer is coming from Zion as the gospel spreads throughout the world. And it is through that preaching of the gospel that the deliverer will come into the hearts of multitudes of Jewish people and will banish ungodliness from Israel. And Paul goes on to say, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The glorious new covenant which Jesus spoke about on the night in which he was betrayed and which we have observed the memorial of here this morning. That wonderful new covenant will uh, be applied to the hearts of these uh, countless Jewish um, converts who come to faith in Jesus, their Messiah. Now, there's something I really want to emphasize this morning, and that is that nowhere is Paul emphasizing a salvation that will come to Israel apart from the gospel which he preached. Paul's kinsmen after the flesh will be saved in the exactly the same way as the Gentile converts will be, were, saved, will, were saved and will be saved through Paul's ministry and through the ministry of the gospel in the present way. There is no other way to be saved. Paul begins this gospel by saying, the gospel is the power of God to salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he's not using the word saved or salvation in a different way when he comes to this chapter. If he was, he would explain that he was. He wants us to know that he's building on the foundation that he laid in chapter 1. And when it comes to the salvation of Israel, the only way of salvation that they have had and have presently and will ever have is salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. There is no other gospel, there can be no other gospel, and there never will be another gospel. And so let's come finally to the explanation of the mystery. I promise not to take too long over this. I've been getting a bit excited, and when I get a bit excited, I tend to go on a bit long. Uh, my family know how to stop me, but uh, please don't ask them what the secret is. And Paul puts the explanation in these wonderful words in verse 28. 
As regards the gospel, they, that is the Jews, are enemies of God for your sake. The Jews, says Paul, are in a state of enmity against God because they consistently reject his son. But he adds, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Incidentally, what Paul is saying about the Jews, of course, here is, of course, true of all of us. All of us were enemies of God, as he says in Romans chapter 5. All of us were children of wrath, as he says in Ephesians. All of us were dead in trespasses and in sins. And so what is true of them was true of us until God came to us in the grace, in his wonderful grace. And that's what Paul is telling us here. And Paul goes on to say, with a note of absolute wonderment in his words, in verse 29, that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God is not giving up on that ancient calling of his people. And he goes on to say in verses 30 to 31, just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too now have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also may receive mercy. What does that mean? By what means is God going to open the eyes of his ancient people? How is God going to create the jealousy or the hunger for the gospel that we read of earlier in the chapter? How will God create that jealousy in the hearts of his ancient people? Will it be because they see the fullness of the Gentiles coming in such a remarkable way that they too will respond to the gospel? That somehow they will come to see the Gentile believers, Gentile believers in enjoyment of the blessings promised in the Old Testament, so much so that they too want to be part and parcel of what God is doing and want to share in those blessings. And then they will recognize that the only open door by which they can do so is through Jesus Christ and that they will come and receive him and acknowledge him as Messiah and Lord. They will come through the same door and be saved on the same basis through this new covenant saved by Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And now Paul ties it all up with what in some ways is a summary of all that he said in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 in Romans up to now. First of all, he says that God has consigned us all to disobedience. And that sums up Romans 1, 18 to 320. No one is righteous, no, not one. Every mouth is shut. The whole world is guilty before God, whether Jew or Gentile. God has consigned us all to disobedience. You're, you're disobedient. You're full of sin, says God, regardless of your race, regardless of whether you're Jew or Gentile. You are sinful and disobedient in my sight. But Paul goes on to say, God has consigned us all to disobedience, yet he might have mercy on all. And that's what he conveys in chapters 4 to 8, doesn't he? The wonderful way in which God is showing mercy to all who believe in Jesus Christ. And that includes guilty sinners like you and me. Well, now someone may object to all of this and say, this is a real problem to me because God seems to be treating the Jews as a special case here. But it really shouldn't be a problem at all because at the present time, God is treating Gentiles as a special case, a very special case. Until the coming of Christ, it was the time of the Jews. But after the coming of Christ and his rejection by his own people, it was the time of the Gentiles. But the time is coming 
when God will say there are now no special cases. Or put it another way, God's going to be saying everyone is a special case, Jew, Gentile, when that fullness of time comes, will be brought into the kingdom of God. Now it's very important in closing to realize that when Paul says that God is going to do this in order that he might have mercy on all, he's not teaching universalism. By universal I mean the doctrine that everybody ever who has lived is going to be saved. When Paul uses the word all, He's not using it with the idea that all without exception are going to be saved. That all without exception will, receive, will have received God's mercy. He's saying all without distinction. That is, all without distinction between Jew and Gentile will be saved. There will be no distinction. All will be special cases. And multitudes will surround the throne of God in the coming day, comprising Jew and Gentile, one people under God, praising the Lamb that sits upon the throne, the Jewish Messiah, our Saviour, Lord of Jew and Gentile. How we look forward to that day, and may God help us all to live positively, not just to intellectually think about that day, not just to work out detailed plans of how it might occur and when it might occur, but to live passionately for that day, doing our part in the service of God in carrying the gospel to those who need it. May God bless his word to our hearts.